Welcome back to another edition of Our City. A few things going around the city of Elizabeth this week. On Wednesday, October 30th at 5 in the afternoon, I'm going to be at the annual Harbor Fest, which takes place in the Bank of America parking lot on Jefferson Avenue. It's a free community event hosted by the city of Elizabeth, our Department of Health and Human Services, the Department of Recreation and the Office on Youth and Services, and Union County Freeholder Sergio Granados has been extremely helpful as well. This event features free food, hayride, games, costumes, entertainment, music, and much more. It's a great event. Bring the kids out. Celebrate Halloween. For more information, please call 908-820-4051. And since October 30th is Mischief Night, we ask all of our concerned citizens to be safe and to be smart. And on Thursday, October 31st at 1.30, I'll join students at School 18 on Cross Avenue. It will be a trunk or treat event. Many of the schools in the city have these events. Also, Councilman Torres has one in the first ward. And on Halloween, please be safe. Parents, make sure you check the candy bags and look for any open candy. And if it's open and unwrapped, please throw it out. On Monday, November 4th at 11 o'clock in the morning, a ribbon cutting for the new interpretive signs that's installed outdoors on the grounds of the historic First Presbyterian Church and Burial Grounds on Broad Street. It's part of the Crossroads of the American Revolution, and it's a statewide signage program. It features a six-pointed star used in the original United States flag. The signs are designed to make it easier for residents and heritage tourists to locate key revolutionary or historic sites and learn more about the state's deep Revolutionary War heritage. And keep in mind, this building, the Snyder Academy, is where both Alexander Hamilton and Aaron Burr at one time attended college. For more information, please call 908-355-9797. They did not attend college at the same time, however. Later that evening at 7 o'clock, an artful journey, an art exhibit featuring an Elizabeth artist, Daphne Manzion, is on the third floor of the Elizabeth Public Library. Please join me for that exhibition as well. And just a reminder, Tuesday, November 5th is Election Day, and whoever you're going to vote, the most important thing is to go out and vote. Please remember, it is important to cast your ballot on November 5th. If you need more information concerning these events or any other events, please call our Public Information Office at 908-820-4124. And for tonight's show, I am pleased to be joined by the Acting Director, of Consumer Affairs, the Director of the Division of Consumer Affairs, uh, Mr. Paul Rodriguez. Paul, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. So, Paul, first of all, the thing we always ask uh, our guests to tell us about themselves, uh, where'd you come from? Uh, I hope you're a Jersey guy. I am a Jersey guy. I grew up in Union City. Okay. Yes. And uh, my, I still have family in, it, it, still have some family in Union City. My grandparents are there. My, my dad is uh, in in Richfield Park now. My mom is in. So was your Park. family part of the Cuban immigration to go to Union they City? They were, yes, they were. Because yeah. uh, Albio series, the congressman, that's right. He talks awful lot about the large Cuban immigration that occurred not only in Union City but also in Elizabeth. But Havana on the Hudson. Is that what it's called? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, you you're on the Hudson. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And it's it's next to Weehawken. I mentioned Aaron Burr, which is that's right. That's yeah. right. And I lived in Weehawken site? for a while. Did you ever visit that site on the water? Where Aaron Burr, there's a marker. I'm there is a marker and there's a, there's a bust of him. Although there's, last I had heard, maybe they have found it. They didn't quite know exactly where it was. But yes, there's a, there's a bust there and a marker. So they made it up something yeah. where, they, where the actual <laughs> duel occurred, right? The, the best guess, I yeah. think. So you went to school here, uh, college, uh, New Jersey, where'd you go? Yeah, so I went to, uh, yeah, went to grammar school in, uh, in Union City. I went to Montclair State University uh, okay. for college, and then I went to, uh, to law school at Yale. At Yale? Yeah. Oh, Montclair to Yale. It's a good trip. <laughs> so you and some famous people, are you part of that Skulls and Bones thing? Or uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I couldn't say if I was. Yeah, exactly. No, no. You couldn't say if you were. <laughs> uh, so the Division of Consumer Affairs, D did you come through state government, Paul, or did you... Get an appointment. How did how did your career uh, go forward after Yale Law School? So I was uh, appointed by Governor Murphy. Um, worked for for uh, Attorney General uh, Gabriel Graywall. Um, I was I actually worked used to work for uh, Senator Frank Lautenberg. Did you? Uh, and so actually my first job was was in Newark where I'm working now. Lautenberg was a good guy. He was great. Yeah, he was, was a, he's a fun man to know. I remember when he first ran in 1982, and he was running for the U.S. Senate. 
and Senator Ray Lesniak, our yeah. state senator, had an event to meet and greet uh, Frank Lautenberg. I didn't yeah. know who he was and did some research. We became uh, friends, uh, the senator and I, and uh, he was a great representative. He really so, was. He really so was. When, when he passed, uh, former Congressman Matt Ronaldo and I were the f first two to attend the viewing. Mm -hmm. And the congressman looks at me and he says, you know, Frank would have loved this, that we were the first two to show up at the, uh, at the viewing. I never forget that from him. So, you know, One of the things that, that has always inspired me in, in public service is that he would always say that one of the reasons we were here was to make people believe that government could work uh, and to make sure that when they contact us, we help them as best we can. You were probably not on his staff in the early 80s, but Senator Lautenberg is responsible for the reason the drinking age in this country is 21 years of age. There was a transportation bill working its way through the Senate and the House and eventually signed by President Reagan that said if you want transportation dollars from the federal government, then you must raise your drinking age to 21. And a lot of the liquor industry and everyone else was deeply appalled by that. However, it passed and Senator Lautenberg was responsible for it. I think the issue was that people were, because there was different ages in different states, people would go somewhere to get alcohol and then drive back drunk. Yeah. yeah. Staten Island was a in my day, that's where everybody went. I was a designated driver, though. I knew it, so that was a good thing. So, so the Division of Consumer Affairs, uh, what's, what's the services that it provides, Paul? So we're the consumer protection agency for the people of New Jersey. So we're housed within the Attorney General's office. Our job, for, for one, is to do things like this, to educate consumers to make sure that they can identify scams, that they don't you know, fall victim to, to unscrupulous practices. But unfortunately, if they do fall victim, it's our job then to investigate and then we civilly enforce. So we don't do criminal cases, uh, although we work with criminal authorities, but we will investigate. In New Jersey, we have uh, one of the strongest consumer fraud acts in the country. So we are uh, able to investigate if there have been, if someone has fallen victim to uh, some sort of scam or unscrupulous business practice, we're able to get to find the business. We're able to then also, you know, try, most importantly, and we're able to get sometimes restitution back for the for the victim. But then most importantly, we're trying to change those practices and either put that person out of business or make sure that they adhere to our law so that other people don't fall victim. Um, now, you know, what you think about generally is that Consumer Fraud Act when you think of the Division of Consumer Affairs, but there's a lot of other things that we do. So we also regulate a lot of occupations and professions. There's about 49 occupations and profession, uh, professional boards right now. They license three quarters of a million individuals in the state of New Jersey. Every from doctors and nurses to plumbers and architects. And they also will make sure that, um, you know, first of all, that's part of that is, is customer service, getting people licensed who need to be licensed. But it's also making sure that once you have that license, that people are uh, there, you know, that they're, they're there to protect the people of New Jersey. So if they're there, we set rules for how that, that, uh, that uh, profession should operate. And if people violate those rules, we can go in and, you know, potentially take their license away. So those rules are set up by your office or are they set up by the state legislature? So the, the, it's both. So our, the state legislature sets the, you know, the, the statutory scheme will then, exp it's the big picture. And then it falls on either the division or the individual boards to set uh, more detailed rules and regulations to, you know, clear any I, any questions that may, may so arise. give me some examples of some of the scams that you mentioned and some of the, uh, some of my friends tell me over there like a, a hotel may overcharge or a gas station may overcharge and uh, you're, you're not getting lead gas whatever that is but right. tell me tell me some of the examples that you would do in some of the scams so I mean it, it, it's all sorts of things. So obviously, you know, we'll look into sometimes it's big picture financial scams. So you're looking at, um, you know, whether a you know, student loan company or, or a mortgage company is somehow not applying payments correctly or steering people to the, to, to the wrong sort of repayment thing, uh, re, re, uh, re, repayment program. But there's also issues where, you know, individuals um, will go, a uh, home improvement contractor, for example, which we register, may take your money and then never show up. Or you that may happens have, a lot sometimes. It does happen it? Yeah. a lot. Um, we have car manufacturers or car uh, dealers who may do a bait and switch or may sell you, some, you know, a, a car that they know you can't afford. We actually took action against an auto dealer earlier this year 
that was in the business of selling people cars, repossessing them and selling them again, sometimes up to five times in a year. Wow. The same vehicle. Um, and then, you know, we, we'll do things like, you know, there's, there's all sorts of scams in other areas. So there's scams in charities where people will set up a fake charity, um, take the money themselves, pocket the money themselves. We have issues where um, you may have a, an auto repair. So shop. on that issue yeah. with GoFundMe pages, it must be a struggle sometimes. It is. It is. I mean, a lot of what we do is about educating consumers so that they can identify some of the, the red flags. And, you know, that's probably the most important thing that we can do as, a, as an agency because I hear from people a lot. That, you know, the FTC has done some studies on why people fall victim to scams and who doesn't fall victim. And a lot of times it's the same people, same, you know, age, level of education, everything. The difference was that someone had heard of the scam before. So, you know, you get uh, one of the copycats copycat well so, so if you know about the scam you're more likely to recognize it and not fall for it so i mean one of the things that i i can guarantee most of the the viewers here will have fallen victim to or at least have attempt. received the calls right. the attempt is you know these these unsolicited calls on the phone i get uh, them all the time i get them all the time one of the things a lot of times they pretend to be a government agency in fact we had some there were people trying to be our, pretending to be our office calling up our doctors and our nurses and saying that there was an issue with their license and so the most important thing and the most common ones are are people calling and claiming to be the Social Security Administration. Your Social Security number is going to be uh, revoked or something like that, or you have to pay your back on taxes and you have to pay taxes. It's important to know, you know, the government is never going to call you and demand immediate payment. One of the most common forms of payment is gift cards too. Gift cards are for giving gifts. Uh, they're not for making a payment to a government agency, and that's one of the most common scams. It's, there, it's untraceable, it's very hard to get the person. So if anybody's watching the show and wants to know a scam, your advice is don't pay attention to any phone call. That's right. There, That's right. There's no way the government in any agency, Social Security, Consumer Affairs, law enforcement, FBI is ever calling you. They're not going to call you to get your private information and, and demand an immediate payment over the phone. What they try to do, a lot of these scammers, is throw you off balance. They want to scare you. The other one that's another similar scam that's not pretending to be the government is try someone pretending to be your grandchild. And this happens all the time. There's someone who will, who will call up and claim, hey, you know, my, sorry, you know, Ned, I'm my jail. voice, yeah, yeah, I'm in jail. My voice sounds a little, a little different because I was just roughed up in jail. I need you to send money right away. Uh, and it, it, they try to scare you and they try to, or they'll, they'll say, I found your, your, your grandson hit on, by a car on the side of the road. You need to send me money right now so I, we, can, we can take care of him. D d can, you, can you actually trace any of that stuff? The calls are very difficult to trace. Right. The technology nowadays is, you know, we work with the federal government, the FTC, the FBI. The calls themselves are very difficult to trace. That's why, and the method of payment that's, that's uh, preferred, you've got wire transfers and you've got uh, gift cards. Those are also very hard to trace. So the most important thing is that people understand, they recognize that this is a scam, and they not fall for so it. So how many calls do you receive in a given year? We get about 12,000 in a year just on consumer protection sort of scams as opposed to our boards and occupational licenses. So how do you, how do you deal with, you got to, you got to sift through those, right? You can't go through all 12,000. That's right. That's right. So what we do is we, we look at it for, uh, we try to see, you know, wh wh who are the people that we can help? A lot of the calls, unfortunately, don't have enough information. A lot of the calls are, you know, maybe anonymous or they may not have, you know, people don't keep receipts or anything like that. To the extent that we're able to find, you know, we sift through, we look for patterns, which are the areas that people are affected the most. It, to the extent that we can send them uh, to someone where the, you know, they might be better suited. So if they're calling from another state, we might send them to that other state. Sometimes it's an issue that another state agency deals with. And then our, uh, some of the counties have offices. Here in, in uh, Union County, there's, a, there's an Office of Consumer Protection. And if it's a local issue, maybe one store here in, in, in Union County, we might send them to that office. So do you get complaints out of Elizabeth? And you probably can't talk about it, but... Uh, well, a, a yeah. big picture, we get, I think in the last year, we've gotten about 123 complaints was the number I saw. 123. 123, you know. <laughs> exactly. Just off the top of my head. And, uh, and you know, it, it matches our pattern. So the number one thing that people complain about is home problems with home improvement contractors. Right. Same here for the city of Elizabeth. Um, we've got um, the other most common ones. Auto sales, lending, and repairs are number two complaint. 
Um, it's also top here in Elizabeth, particularly uh, auto repair shops, a lot of complaints against them. Um, and it, so it, it really matches our... Paul, we're going to take a break, run a commercial, and we're going to come back and talk about the process to file. I just want to correct one thing I said in the beginning is when uh, it was Senator Lautenberg and I who attended Congressman Ronaldo's services, it. it wasn't okay. the other way around. And we walked in together and he said, Maddie would appreciate that you and I are the first two here. Please stay with us after these messages back with Paul Rodriguez in the Division of Consumer Affairs. Welcome back to Our City, where I'm joined by Paul Rodriguez, the Acting Director of Consumer Affairs. And Paul, one of the things we were talking about before the break were complaints. So if there's someone in a city or anywhere, for that matter, how do they process it? How do they file the complaint? The best way to do it is to go to our website, if you can, njconsumeraffairs.gov. There's a red button on the, upper red, uh, on the upper right corner. It says file a complaint. You can call us to get more information, but we need all the complaints in writing because we need it in your words. And also, we often need receipts and other accompanying documentation. So if you can do it through the website, and if you can't, you can send it to us by mail. Do they now. know? Do, do you send something back to them that says it's being investigated or it's been forwarded to a an investigator or something like that? They can always check on the on the status of the complaint. Oh, they can? Um, yeah, so they'll get an acknowledgement if they follow it electronically, and then you can also reach and it. And if the complaint gets closed, they know about that? Yes. Okay. So uh, how, how it works in the the list of occupant, occupations that you talked about, uh, which was question you said you wanted to cover in a lot of different areas, and I think you did. So do you do outreach to communities on these issues? And what about different languages, especially in our area? Sure, sure. You probably speak Spanish, too, I right? do speak Spanish. Oh, okay, good. So <laughs> that, that, that's easy for you. But we also have, you know, we have a uh, Far Eastern population. Sure. We have a, a Creole population. We have a Syrian population coming in. How do you deal with those languages? So first of all, in terms of outreach, we have, a, we have an outreach team. They go out and they'll go to senior centers, they'll go to schools, um, they'll go to, you know, to the extent that there's, you know, sometimes fairs, outdoor, indoor, even career fairs, because there's career scams. Uh, anywhere, you know, if you want to have What's a scam. What's a career scam? So, you know, so they will set up, there are scammers that will set up information. So either they're going to try to get your personal information by trying to get solicit resumes, and then you've got your, your name, your address, your email address, your phone number there, and then they'll try to contact you to get information. Or... We've seen scams where they'll try to get you to pay in advance. So, oh, we've got this job. All you got to do is you pay $500 for a background check or something like that. They're not even, you know, often they don't even set up an interview. They never see you. They claim that, you know, this, they want to get numbers, as many people as possible. I've never heard of this one, there. so thank you yes. for this education. Yeah. And so we have, we do have, uh, most of our outreach is in English and, and in Spanish. We do have some people that speak other languages. Certainly, we are trying to offer as much as we can in other languages. So on our website, all our complaint forms are in English and Spanish, some of our consumer briefs. Um, we have a, a language line so that when people call, 
any language uh, that's spoken, it's an outside translator that will come and they can do simultaneous translation uh, so that if people are, you know, fall victims, we can, we can help them. And it's something that we care a lot about because if people are, the more that they feel unconnected to government, the more that they feel that there's not someone that they can get answers from, the more likely that they are to fall victim so to scam. So we always read about uh, stories where your information is stolen from a major credit corporation or Saks or Nordstrom and Sorry to mention those companies, they're just ones my wife shops at. But <laughs> they, they always try to take, and they'll say there's a major data breach in yeah. cybersecurity. How do you deal with those two issues? So first of all, I mean, as we talked about before, education is one of the most important things. So, you know, we do a lot of education. This happens, October happens to be Cybersecurity Month. Okay. Uh, so we are preparing actually this month education materials. We're going- It's we're, also Breast Cancer Awareness Month. And it is. Pink tie got my pink so tie. You, you got like everything covered this month. <laughs> yeah. um, thanks for noticing. <laughs> we actually have, uh, so we're putting together education materials for grammar, middle, you know, elementary, middle school, and high school. On for, so people are aware of about cybersecurity, if kids are getting access to the internet earlier and earlier these days, and so they're putting information online, and they don't have as good a sense or as good a sense as we would like them to have about how the information they put on there, it's up there forever. I just participated yeah. with our acting prosecutor, Lindsay Rotolo, in a cyberbully uh, oh, yeah. component for uh, a grade school, the Albert Einstein School, and she and her team went over there and explained to these kids, fifth, sixth graders, seventh graders what to expect and they all, they all had a cell phone fifth grade they all had one yeah so they they all had access to the internet any data cases data breach cases worth mentioning here in new jersey yeah so we've had we've had quite a few we, we, we investigate quite a few um we have in new jersey i mean big picture to give you a sense um we have hundreds of notifications a year of, of data breaches. Uh, we've settled uh, some big ones recently so that we had, um, you know, the Equifax breach is one of the ones that affected the most number of consumers around the country. Um, in New Jersey, um, there are you know, millions of, uh, of a, a potentially, a potentially affected consumers. Uh, that was a settlement of $175 million. Wow. It was set up. Um, $425 million uh, as well was set up as a a consumer restitution fund. Um, we had one with Premier Blue Cross as well, um, and that was for um, some uh, lack of security that exposed social security numbers and health information. That was uh, settled for $10 million, um, about you know, 72,000. But did they get information million. on people's prescriptions or something in that area? Uh, it was, it was health care information, but also social security numbers. And okay. I mean, there's been other cases. I mean, last year we had a settlement with a company that was, that had um, submitted information about people's HIV status information that you could see, unfortunately, through the window of the, of the envelope. So it comes in all forms. Well, interesting. The, the, the scams that you talk about, what is the consumer bowl? Is, so the, the is that a scam? Bowl, it's not a scam. Oh, good. It's not a scam. My no. notes here, I'll explain the consumer bowl. I'm like, I wonder if that's a scam. No, no, the no, consumer that's bowl. That's a good thing. It's a good thing. Let's it's get off of scams. Outreach. We're going to talk about good things. <laughs> it's part of our, our outreach efforts. So it's it's basically a, a game show format. That It's how we educate the next generation of consumers. We go to high schools, uh, We ha and we the high schools will compete against each other on knowledge about scams, about regulations, to make sure that they're educated consumers when they enter the, the marketplace. Well, the one you told me about on the, on the job program is something that probably should really be enforced at the high school level. Right. Right. My daughter's a sophomore in college. It's something I'm gonna call her about right away. I mean, yeah. I, I never heard of that one. Clever. It is, it is. And, and I just wanna, Mentioned too that there is a, an, an Elizabeth School that's part of that takes place in the that takes part in the consumer board. Oh really? Uh, it's Thomas Edison Career and Technical oh, Academy. Oh sure. Yeah, they do a lot of good things over there. Yeah. I, I, and, and tell me uh, initiatives that deal with growing crisis of prescription drugs. Uh, I mentioned it briefly. Tell yeah. me more about how your office is involved. So we're involved with it in in a lot of different ways. So first of all, I should say Attorney General Graywall set up a a new office to handle uh, coordinated efforts uh, across the the Department of Law and Public Safety. Which you know, Law and Public Safety he oversees the State Police, Consumer Affairs, the Division of Law, and together there's there's an office now that coordinates all of our anti-opioid uh, work. It's called NJ Cares, 
Um, what we do, we have sued, we have brought lawsuits, first of all, against uh, some of the drug manufacturers. Um, you, know, well, you know, in the news today, there's information about, you know, about Purdue Pharma, against the, the Sackler family. We've brought lawsuits against them. Um, they, we have also, well, we'll bring cases against- But well, there's an attempt to settle that case, but the Attorney General said he, he was opposed to that settlement. That's correct. That's yeah. correct. And what he has said is that we are going to bring, we are going to tackle the opioid crisis in New Jersey, whether it's you know through state police, whether it's people slinging drugs on the corner, or whether through the Division of Consumer Affairs, it's uh, you know, someone who's selling drugs in out of a doctor's office or doing something incorrectly in a, out of the boardroom. Um, and so we will also bring cases against indiscriminate prescribers, so doctors, other prescribers who are essentially just selling drugs. They're selling a script. Because they write, they write a script for... Exactly. 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock. They just <laughs> keep writing scripts all day long, right? And unfortunately, we've, we've seen some pretty egregious cases of, of patients coming in. You know, we, we might have uh, some video, for example, or, or, or testimony we might send in an undercover patient. Sometimes we work with, law with, with criminal law enforcement, come in and the doctor will say, what do you want? And the, the patient will say, oh, you know, I, I'm going to sell this afterwards, and they'll give it to them anyway. And so we really? can come in, and so the Division of Consumer Affairs is the one who authorizes prescribers to, to prescribe controlled dangerous substances like opioids, but then the boards license them. So we can take away their ability to prescribe, and the boards can take away their license or suspend them. And then also, in addition to that, we have a drug tape back program that the residents here should know about. So if you've got extra, extra uh, pharmaceutical medications that are, have expired, that you no longer need, you can bring them in. Uh, the police departments have what we call a project medicine drop. It's, it's basically a, a mailbox. It's no questions we asked. We have one of those in police headquarters. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. It's, it's white. It's no questions asked. What do they do with the medicine? Do they burn it? They do. They they do. do. Actually, it's, it's burned and it, it makes energy. Uh, it does. It does. It does. So is there one facility in New Jersey that burns? Do you, there do you, is, do yeah. You know? Oh, there is. Yeah. There's one facility that, that burns it and converts it to energy. Um, and it's, it's great because it apparently, and the, the statistic, it's something like 70% of the people who end up being addicted to heroin first got addicted because they found prescription drugs in someone's medicine cabinet. It was just too, too, too easy to find. And sometimes, you know, there was a time in which, you know, I think doctors have changed their practices a lot. There was a time when they prescribed for 30 days when they only wanted you to take right. four days. Okay. And so people just kept them in their, mail, in, in their medicine cabinets. That's very, very dangerous. You don't want your child or your grandchild okay. to fall, fall victim. So before we close, we're running out of time. We got to talk about the holiday season. I mean, there's always a lot of scams around the holiday season. Tell us, tell me and our viewers what to expect, what to watch out for during the holiday season. So a couple of things to, to keep in mind for the holiday season. One is just is charities. I mentioned them before. They, we really see a lot of scams, um, both in the holiday season and after, after natural disasters. Um, in the holiday season, you know, just think of charity solicitations the same way you think of other things that you're going to buy online. If someone is sending you, and, and this is just good practice in general, someone's sending you an unsolicited email, or if you're seeing something on Facebook, that's, you know, it, it, don't tr necessarily trust that. Don't click links in email from people that you don't recognize to give money. A lot, you, know, you can always, you know, and unfortunately, you see scams for charities, and you see scams for businesses like this. It's a fake, it's a fake website. Sometimes they're very good at making it look like a real charity, making it look like a real business. When you click on it, it will look similar. Just go to that website yourself. If you want to find a charity or you find a business that you want to do business with, go to that website yourself. Don't click it from the website or for, from, from uh, an email. From from an email. Uh, similarly, you know, because we register charities, you can check this with us to make sure that the charity is registered in New Jersey and that they're allowed to, to solicit funds. Um, you know, going into the, the, the cold and winter season, I, last, I, a couple weeks ago, you had uh, David Freed, our we superintendent yeah. of, of we, our Office of Weights and Measures. He goes out and he looks and makes sure that you know trucks that have that carry home heating oil will are actually that their meters are set up correctly. And every once in a while, you know, you'll find and we actually took we did a, a sweep and we had to take some of those vehicles off the road because you know the there were problems with the meters. It's always in, unfortunately in favor of uh, uh, of the company and not the consumer. Uh, but we are making sure that that's happening. If you feel you you know there might there's something hinky going on, you should make a complaint to us as well. Paul, I want to thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to join us here today and educate the residents of New Jersey about the work that the Consumer Affairs Division does. It's my pleasure. Thank, thank you very you. much.
For Paul Rodriguez, I'm Mayor Chris Bolwage. We'll see you next week on another edition of Our City. <laughs>